and welcome to Birds of Loudoun, brought to you by Loudoun County Public Library and the Loudoun Wildlife Conservancy. I'm Lorraine Moffa, Programming Coordinator at the Library and your host today. Please feel free to communicate with me during the program by using the chat feature located on the bottom right of the WebEx screen. At the end of the presentation, I can relay your questions to our speaker. It's my pleasure to welcome our speaker, Joe Coleman. Joe is a founding member of the Loudoun Wildlife Conservancy, established in 1995. He led the campaign to create the Banshee Reeks Nature Preserve in 1999, and in 2000 became the first president of the Friends of Banshee Reeks. Currently, while, when he is not volunteering with the Loudoun Wildlife Conservancy, Joe is the treasurer and the chairman of the Conservation and Land Use Committee of the Board of Directors of the Blue Ridge Center for Environmental Stewardship and a past president of the Virginia Society of Ornithology. He was the president of the Board of Directors of the Audubon Naturalist Society from 2003 to 2005 and on its board from 2000 to 2006. He also served on the board of the directors of the Land Trust of Virginia and currently serves on their easement acquisition committee. Since 1997, Joe has organized and compiled the Central Loudoun Christmas Bird Count and coordinated many of Loudoun Wildlife's birding activities. Thank you for your service, <laughs> Joe. Welcome tonight. Well, thank you, Lorraine. And I'd like to thank the uh, Loudoun County Public Libraries and Loudoun Wildlife Conservancy uh, for giving me an opportunity to talk about something I really love to talk about, and that's birds. Um, they're truly magnificent and fascinating, um, and they fascinated um, humankind forever. Uh, obviously, the fact that they can fly, we find very intriguing, but it's not just that they fly. Uh, there's an enormous variety in birds. Um, they look beautiful, um, and they vary significantly from this enormously, uh, for a bird, large bald eagle, um, who is a magnificent uh, flyer. This is a bird that had almost disappeared from the lower 48 um, and was fortunately saved by the Endangered Species Act. And I'll talk a little bit more about that a little bit later on. Um, but they vary in size from this bird to tiny little ruby-throated hummingbirds, which by the way, regardless of where you live in Loudoun County, if you put up a hummingbird feeder on your balcony in an apartment, um, on an estate in Western Loudoun, there's a good chance that you're going to get a ruby-throated hummingbird showing up at your house. Um, they're starting um, to travel north in the United States. This is a tiny little bird, by the way, um, weighs less than a penny, um, crosses the Caribbean in the fall and overwinters in Central America and Northern South America, um, almost increases its, almost doubles its weight with fat reserves so that it can fly across the Caribbean um, during that time period. As I said, they're starting to show back up in our area. They'll visit our feeders for a little while, but then they'll stop visiting our feeders as our native foliage, our trees, our shrubs, our wildflowers start to flower out and it'll start visiting them for natural nectars. Um, one of the trees that they find fantastic is tulip poplars. And tulip poplar flowers are flowers that most of us aren't aware of because they're generally high up in the canopy. Um, but a lot of insects utilize them and the hummingbirds love the nectar from them. Um, this is another very small bird that we can find at feeders. Uh, Carolina chickadee, it's common throughout the county. Um, it actually is a year-round resident here. A uh, very small bird, has a lot of personality, and it's very fond of our feeders. Um, so if you put up a feeder, you're going to get a chickadee in all likelihood and get to enjoy it. We also get rare visitors to our feeders, and a lot of people don't realize it. Uh, this is a rufous hummingbird. It's actually a very hardy western hummingbird. Um, it nests in the northwestern United States and even into southern Alaska. And every year, some of these end up uh, flying all the way across the country to the mid-Atlantic. And they'll stay in our area. They don't show up generally until October, November. They must be following uh, or using strong winds to get across the country. Um, 
but then they end up uh, showing up in our area and they'll stay for a while. This photo was actually taken in January at my own feeders uh, some years back and was counted um, for the Western Loudon Christmas bird count as a result of that. Uh, definitely looks different from that ruby throated you saw a few minutes ago. We also have a lot of other nesting residents, uh, great horned owls, and owls have always fascinated people. At different times, they've been omens um, of doom and evil. Now, most of us find them uh, very romantic symbols, uh, you know, very appealing and um, get inspired. Uh, this is the owl that makes the traditional <laughs> call and is a whole lot of fun to listen to. They nest throughout the county. They're not as common as a couple of our other owls, uh, but they are here and they're pretty high on the food chain. Um, they definitely eat small mammals, birds. They're very optimistic, but they're also pretty much totally nocturnal. And this is a parent with two of its uh, nestlings. And uh, as I said, they are a successful nester in the county. Um, this is a red-bellied woodpecker. And, and uh, I'm always like to tell a little story. This is, I, I wasn't always a bird watcher. Um, both my sisters were watching birds long before I was. And uh, what I preferred to do was I loved being outdoors, but what I wanted to do was go hiking. I wanted to go bicycling. Um, I wanted to, you know, walk along the Appalachian Trail or walk miles along the Potomac River um, and just kind of get the general feel of being outdoors. One of my sisters convinced me about 30 years ago that I should stop and take a look at birds that were out there and she loaned me her binoculars and said, look at that woodpecker. And I looked at this specific woodpecker, this red bellied woodpecker, and was absolutely intrigued by it. Um, the red wash on its stomach, the back of the head being red, that very impressive beak. And since then, uh, that got me involved in birding. And since then, I've been birding and been birding in many places in the U.S. Uh, and a lot of other places and really enjoyed it. Um, this is often called a red-headed woodpecker by amateurs, but in actuality, this is the red-headed woodpecker. Uh, this is a woodpecker who really loves acorns. Now, obviously, acorns aren't available to it until late in the summer or early in the fall. And some years when there's a really low acorn crop, this bird will pretty much totally disappear from Loudoun County as they did this past winter. Other winters, when there's a big acorn crop, they'll stay around. They're starting to come back after they left this past winter, and they're visiting our feeders again. Uh, I mean, not our feeders, but they're visiting our areas again. There's a large population of them, different colonies throughout western Loudoun, but they also show up in some of our riverside parks like Algonquian, Horseman Preserve and Bless Park. Um, you can see them in those locations. Uh, I think they've been reported back in Algonquin now for about a month, and there's some feeling that there's definitely a couple pairs nesting there. Um, if the other thing that's fascinating about woodpeckers when you think about it, these birds bang their head on that wood sometimes all day long in order to get insects, grubs, and things like that that are under the bark. Um, they have reinforced skulls so that basically they can use their beak like a sledgehammer and pound in there. Just imagine if you pounded your own head um, against a log for several hours, I think you'd end up addling your brain. But because of this reinforced skull that they have, they don't do that. The tips of the feathers, the tail right down at the bottom is also pointed and very stiff and very firm, more so than a lot of, and most other birds. And that's actually to help it be stable on the tree while it moves up and down the tree, and especially while it's pounding away at the tree trunk. Um, one of the reasons why Loudoun County has so many birds, there are over 400 species have been documented in the state of Virginia, and over 260 have been documented in Loudoun County. Uh, the Loudoun Wildlife Conservancy just finished uh, a breeding bird, uh, an atlas, a bird atlas, uh, in 2014, we published a wonderful book, um, which is available in both the libraries and uh, for sale through Loudoun Wildlife Conservancy, uh, which you'll see a picture of later on in this program. But the reason why we have so many birds in Loudoun County is we actually have a couple, we have a large variety of ecosystems here. 
Um, we stretch from the eastern edge of the Piedmont to the Blue Ridge Mountains. We have lots of wetlands. We have the uh, Potomac River as our northern bar border. The Shenandoah River, while it doesn't border very much of Loudoun County, only a tiny little tip in the northwestern part of the county, and doesn't even there really touch the county, um, that is close enough to the county that it ends up supporting also a population. We have a lot of varied habitats throughout the county forest, wetlands, and especially wetlands, which were, are one of the rarest habitats. Uh, this photo is of the Dulles Greenway Wetlands Mitigation Project. These are the wetlands that were created to replace the wetlands that were lost when the Greenway was built. And this has been a very productive wetlands in terms of birds and mammals. Um, in terms of mammals, it has river otters and beavers and things like that. In terms of birds, the variety is just incredibly significant. Wetlands are nurseries for a lot of wildlife and especially birds and certain mammals, um, but they also supply support a lot of uh, insects. At the same time, though, they really mitigate flooding that occurs. Um, if this had been kept as grass, uh, farm fields, or even worse, a housing subdivision in the flood lane, floodplain along Goose Creek, um, the water would just flow through here flow down the Goose Creek and cause a whole lot more flooding downstream. By putting in a wetlands there, by having a wetlands there, this actually helps mitigate the impact of flooding because it's much more likely to soak it up. Another really nice wetlands in the county is Bless Park. Um, this is a Loudoun County Park. It's a relatively small park, um, only around 100 acres. It's on the Potomac River near where the George Washington University campus is in eastern Loudoun and it is full of nice wildlife habitat um, and wetlands. It borders the Potomac River, has some forests. Uh, by the way, the flower that's in the forefront here is common milkweed. This is the host plant and the primary host plant for monarch butterflies. They basically need milkweed to survive. Uh, they nectar on it, but they also lay their eggs on it and their young, the caterpillars, end up eating it extensively. Um, but it is home to a wealth of birds as well as small mammals. And, um, you know, because it's small, you can visit it quickly. Now, one of the things we're a little bit concerned about is um, overdevelopment of this particular park, which would result in the loss of some of this really valuable, wonderful wildlife habitat. Uh, we're hoping that Loudoun County Parks realizes that they shouldn't do that that they should not expand the number of playing fields that are already there in the drier areas into the wet areas. It's just bad practice, which will not only increase flooding, but destroy a whole lot of valuable wildlife habitat. Some of the birds that you can find on rivers, ponds, lakes, and places like that, Bless Park and the Dulles Greenway wetlands, is this northern pintail. This is a bird that isn't here in the summer, it migrates through in late fall. Most of them keep going to the Outer Banks of North Carolina or even further south, but a few do overwinter here. Absolutely beautiful duck. The male or drake is on the left in this um, slide and the female is on the right. For ducks, the female is almost always a whole lot more cryptic in color and duller, so she'll blend in the foliage. Uh, and the males are often absolutely beautiful, like this particular northern pintail. Um, this is the northern shoveler. This is the male. Don't have a photo of the female, but again, the female would be much duller. Take a look at that beak, and you can see where it gets its name. Um, it shovels vegetation into its mouth and picks up its food that way, filters it through, and as a result, um, ends up being, um, you know, very effective at finding food and eating food. It is a beautiful duck. A few of them overwinter here, though a lot more of them do go further south. They do not nest here. Um, the ones that are here and the ones further south are already on their way moving north. Um, another bird that isn't here in the winter but does nest here is starting to show up in our area and is pairing off. This is actually a cavity nesting bird. Um, just like bluebirds and many of our other birds, it nests in a hole in a tree. It can be 30, 40, 50 feet above the ground. The female is in the background. Remember, much duller, plainer um, 
markings than this male who is spectacularly beautiful. Um, and like I said, they are nesting birds in the county wherever they can find cavities in trees, holes. And cavities in trees are invaluable for a lot of birds and a lot of wildlife to survive. Um, this is a wood duck female, by the way, with um, I think it's nine, maybe 10 ducklings following her. And one of the things that, the cat, that happens with ducks is um, some female ducks will actually lay their eggs in another female's nest and they'll let that other female raise their young. And I think this is an instance that's because the three ducks that are closest to this um, female wood duck are much larger than the ones in the back. And I think it was an example of what's called dumping. And uh, as a result, she has to raise a whole lot more young. Um, by doing that, I think that first female who might have laid eggs in more than just her nest, but several nests, ends up um, having a great deal of success in passing its genes on. Um, but some of these young do end up disappearing because it's a lot of work for one female to take care of all of them. Um, this is a really delightful bird, which was first documented as nesting in Loudoun County in 2012 as a result of uh, surveys that we did with the Breeding Bird Atlas at that time. This is a hooded meganser. The male's in the foreground, the female with that wonderful hairdo in the background. Um, they're also a cavity nester and nest in holes near ponds and water and things like that. And here's a, here is the female that was actually the first one documented nesting in Loudoun County. Um, they've been documented since then, just, uh, nesting at the Dulles Greenway wetlands, but also in some large stormwater pond, um, pond best management practices uh, throughout uh, Ashburn and even further east in Loudoun County. Not a lot of them, but some of them. And uh, it shows the success of this particular bird and we're thrilled that that is occurring. Um, this is great blue herons. While great blue herons, when they're not nesting, are very comfortable around people, um, when they're in their rookeries having their young, and they're a colonial nester, they nest in groups. Um, you'll have three, five, 30, 40, even 60, 70 nests in these large rookeries. There's one on Broad Run, by the way, um, very near the Water Authority and on the western side of um, the future Kinpora. Um, and that's a large rookery. Um, we worked with the county when they were starting to talk about building Kinpora quite a few years ago, and they agreed to keep that rookery pretty private, especially when the herons are in the nest, which is from uh, late February through early July. Um, and, uh, and another interesting fact about these rookeries, by the way, while great blue herons do not tolerate human beings coming close to them, and that's why there are restrictions on people being able to walk near those rookeries during nesting season, um, great blue herons do tolerate single bald eagle nests, massive bald eagle nests in close proximity um, to their um, rookeries. And the theory is that those bald eagles, by being close by, well, maybe they do occasionally take um, a small, young, great blue heron. They also keep other predators from coming in and raiding those rookeries um, because bald eagles are definitely very high in the food chain. Um, but like I said, this is a bird that's very comfortable around people when it's not nesting, comes to our ponds, our lakes, our stream sides. Uh, but when it's nesting, it doesn't want us too close by. Um, this is a red-winged blackbird. Uh, these birds are full of personality, and they're a whole lot of fun to watch. Uh, they come back and uh, they never really leave, but they uh, start attempting to find nesting territories in the month of February. And, and you'll start hearing them at ponds, one, two, three males. They come in and they start singing. They start displaying. They have this beautiful coloration. And incidentally, I don't have a photo of the female. Um, she is really a dark brown with black lines, also a really beautiful bird, but nothing at all like this. These males come in and they're very comfortable um, singing territory. Uh, my wife and I watched two of them yesterday on the on fences in our neighborhood. 
And both of them were on in the fence, singing away, doing these flight displays into the sky uh, with a female in the background watching. And both of them were trying to convince her that they were the best male ever and that their territory would end up being the best for her to move into. Um, we moved on before either one of them had been successful on that, but it was really a lot of fun watching them, a lot of uh, fun watching them show off that red and those epaulets. Um, they are just a really fun bird that is found nesting in things like cattails and shrub around ponds. Um, meadow and shrub habitat is a habitat that a lot of people really don't like. They find it messy, uh, they don't like it. Um, and unfortunately, that's really unfortunate because it is um, tremendously productive in terms of wildlife. Um, it's full of wildflowers and those wildflowers attract insects. Uh, the scrub and the bushes um, attract a number of small mammals. And as a result, a lot of birds and um, mammals that are predators also use it. And it is actually the most endangered habitat in the entire United States. And the birds that utilize it, especially in areas like the Great Plains, um, their numbers have be, been reduced more than any other type of bird throughout the country. And it is because we as humans generally don't find it attractive and we find it messy and we have a tendency to remove it. And uh, it is incredibly invaluable and should be preserved whenever possible. Um, I think almost every park should have an area set aside that has some. Um, we do have this at uh, Franklin Park and Bless Park, Banshee Reeks. Uh, where there's some really nice meadow habitat. And uh, the problem, of course, with meadow habitat in the East Coast is you do have to maintain it, meaning occasionally you have to cut it down. Um, otherwise, it reforests very quickly. Um, bluebirds use that kind of habitat extensively. Um, one of the things the Loudoun Wildlife Conservancy has done is put up bluebird trails. We have uh, hundreds of volunteers that help with these trails. Uh, they monitor them, they clean them out, um, they make sure that the bluebirds in them are somewhat protected, and um, bluebirds eat a phenomenal amount of insects. They change their diet in the wintertime so that they'll also eat berries and seeds, uh, but they eat a lot of insects. Uh, they'll be hanging out on uh, edge habitat and field habitat doing that, and um, their numbers have rebounded considerably in the United States since people putting up began putting up nest box about 30, 40 years ago. Um, this was another bird that was suffering because we have a tendency, human beings do, to not like uh, trees with holes in them, trees that may be sickly, and we have a tendency to cut them down. And um, my recommendation is if a tree is in a non-dangerous location, it has a hole in it, uh, go ahead and leave it because you'd be surprised at how many birds will end up nesting in it. Um, tree swallows also use the bluebird boxes on our bluebird trails. They make absolutely beautiful nests. Um, while the bluebird is a year-round resident here, tree swallows uh, just started showing up last month, uh, and they'll hang around here for a few months while they have their young in um, cavities. And um, they fly around, and, and their diet is nothing but insects, flying insects. And uh, they're very effective and efficient at that, and an absolutely beautiful bird as well. Um, this is another bird that utilizes um, meadow habitat extensively. It eats um, small rodents, uh, and this rodent that it's carrying, remember birds are incredibly light. They have hollow bones so that they can fly. Um, this vole or this mouse that this particular kestrel is carrying weighs probably almost as much as it. Um, but these kestrels also eat a tremendous amount of things like grasshoppers. Uh, they're going to eat a lot of cicadas in May and June. Uh, that'll be a major part of their diet. Um, there is one problem. Their numbers have decreased significantly in the mid-Atlantic. And um, what we're finding is almost any bird that eats a lot of insects that we don't like, that we use sprays on, herbicides, um, in places where we use pesticides is probably inadvertently getting poisoned when they eat those insects. Um, so I do caution you uh, to avoid using pesticides and herbicides when you can. Um, this is another falcon. 
Um, he hunts everywhere. I just recently saw um, it's not a bird that used to be common at all in Loudoun County. It still isn't. It had virtually disappeared because of DDT and because of the Endangered Species Act and a major program uh, to breed them, they've come back. They're now common residents of a lot of cities and uh, they live in places like under bridges, cliff sides. Um, the first six record of peregrines successfully nesting in Loudoun County occurred a couple years back on the cliff walls of the Luckstone Quarry in 2019. And a bird just like this and its mate raised several young on the edges of that cliff. Some people climbed up there and banded it. Um, I saw my first one of these uh, in a couple years at Banshee Reeks on the edge of one of their meadows recently. Um, they're very opportunistic. They'll eat almost anything. They're an incredibly powerful flyer. I've read that they can fly as much as 200 miles an hour temporarily uh, for a short time period. And you'll remember the wood duck photos you saw earlier. They'll actually hit a wood duck in flight uh, and you know knock it out of the sky and kill it so that they can have it as their prey. Um, but a beautiful bird and a bird that falconers really very much like to fly. Um, and it is a falcon just like the kestrel was, but it's probably the largest common one in our area where the kestrel is our smallest bird of prey, uh, except for this, which is considered an honorary bird of prey. This is actually a birding, a perching bird. It's about the size of a mockingbird. It's also a meadow habitat bird. And uh, it frequently um, hangs out, eats primarily insects, but will also eat mice. Um, and other small rodents. There are approximately um, 2022 species of shrikes throughout the world. There are two in North America. All of them have this very interesting behavior where they cache their prey uh, like a grasshopper or a mouse, but they don't eat right then. They'll actually impale it on a thorn or on a barbed wire fence and come back and nibble on it later on. Obviously, this works very effectively in the winter time. It's a bit more of a problem once the weather gets warm, um, but their system does tolerate um, some issues there. Uh, this is a bird that unfortunately probably no longer nests in Loudoun County. Uh, as I said, it eats a lot of insects. Um, its habitat is meadow habitat, and because of those two things, it has just really dropped off in numbers. It is a state-threatened species in Virginia, um, but because it's not federally protected uh, and not a lot of um, federal money has gone into protecting it and taking care of it, though Virginia is not the only state which is seeing a big decrease in its numbers. And like I said, it is just the size of a mockingbird, um, but it's definitely a very effective hunter. Um, this is a bird um, that we're going to start seeing these. In fact, they are starting to show up again in the county. This is a prairie warbler. Uh, one of the things that's exciting about migration is you get absolutely beautiful birds like this popping up. Um, this bird will not only come into our area on its way further north, it actually nests here in decent numbers. Um, I've heard it singing next to the Broadlands wetlands in uh, you know, Ashburn. Um, I've heard them near Banshee Reeks. I've heard them near Oatlands. Uh, people have picked them up frequently and, I mean, heard them frequently at Bless Park. A uh, really beautiful bird. It's one of the wood warblers. And um, and a lot of these begin showing up. And one of the reasons, and they are one of the reasons why birders go out and check around. Um, this is a cedar waxwing. And uh, this is a bird that eats berries extensively. It's a nomadic bird. If there are a lot of berries in an area, they'll show up. If there aren't a lot of berries, they'll disappear. They do nest in the county but a lot more of them nest in the county when there's a healthy berry crop than those years when you have drought and the berries don't do as well. I have not seen any myself personally in the last two or three months. I know they've been somewhat uncommon. Um, I think a lot of our birds exhausted the berry crops relatively early in winter this winter, and as a result, a lot of these birds moved to other places. However, the ones that do nest here should be beginning to show up again soon and we should begin to be able to see them. This is a yellow-breasted chat. It used to be considered a warbler, but now it's in a family all by itself. It gets its name chat because it 
chatters loudly. And that's the way it, one actually finds it when one is out in the field. It uses the scrub on the edge of a field um, to hide, to nest, uh, to look for food, big insect eater. Um, it's a little bit larger than most of the wood law warblers, but it does make a whole lot of noise. And when you start hearing it making these chattering sounds, you know it's around and you know it's worth looking for. Um, my memory, it's about seven and a half, eight inches and a little bit plumper than most of the warblers that it used to be lumped in with. Um, we get some shorebirds in Loudoun County too. This is a Wilson snipe. Um, I actually saw four of these in my neighborhood the other day, and uh, someone reported eight or nine of them at the Broadwin, Broadlands Wetlands over the weekend. Um, they have that very long beat because they uh, put it, press it in the mud around ponds and eat a lot of the um, small snails and tiny things that are in the mud in that area. And you'll see that while it's not very colorful, it's absolutely beautiful with that beautiful coloration, that striping, it's cryptic, and it totally blends into dead grass or uh, brown grass in fields and disappears from sight. They do not nest here in Loudoun County. They'll be traveling further north to nest, uh, but they are still here and still can be found for a while longer. Um, this is another shorebird that actually does um, by the way, neither one of these birds are especially at the shore, but they're called shorebirds um, because that's a large group of birds um, that look the same, and most of them can be found on the shore. This is a woodcock. Um, woodcocks nest here in small numbers in wooded areas where they can have a lot of privacy, uh, but most of them migrate through our area. And one of the things that's interesting about them, this photo was taken on Capitol Hill. They are attracted a lot to lights and they show up at cities all the time. And unfortunately, one of the biggest killers of birds are high rise buildings and the windows on those buildings and birds like this are attracted by the lighting and end up running into those windows at night. In cities like Baltimore and DC, one of the first tasks of a lot of the janitors um, during migration is to go outside in the morning and collect the dead birds outside the buildings. As a result, a lot of cities have begun major policies to uh, have lights out at night so that they won't attract these kind of birds, uh, so they won't have as many birds killed in their cities. They're also recommending different types of glass that aren't as reflective and won't cause as many problems. Um, it's something that I think uh, all jurisdictions that are somewhat popular should consider doing. Um, but New York has, Chicago has, Toronto has, and it's a program that is really growing throughout the country where town uh, city councils, town councils are actually legislating uh, this. Um, this is another one of the beautiful warblers that passes through our area. It nests here in small numbers. It's a uh, northern parallel and uh, really um, pretty song. And that's the way we find most of these birds. They're tiny. Uh, they run between four and a half, five and a half inches uh, long. Um, they weigh very little, but they have uh, very distinctive songs. They attract us. Those songs bring them to our attention, and then we uh, end up uh, pinning them down and finding them and um, locating them. As I said, this bird will nest here in small numbers, but the majority of them will keep migrating further north. And we hope to hear and see several of these um, starting later and towards the end of April and through May. And uh, the ones that stay will probably keep vocalizing through June and possibly early July. Um, this is another bird that is a local nester, though most of them keep moving north. It's an American red star. Um, you can see where it gets its name. Um, the females, by the way, are nicknamed yellow stars um, because where this bird has red, the uh, females have yellow. It also has a very distinctive call, and that coloration shows up quite well um, and is a lot of fun to find. And it's a pretty vocal bird when it is actually um, nesting and declaring territory. Um, we also have some wonderful owls in the county. You saw the picture of the great horned owl earlier. Um, this is a barred owl, and this is probably the most common owl in the entire county. Um, and uh, this is the owl that makes the who cooks for you sound. Who cooks for you? 
And um, if they're, they're scattered throughout the county, they're pretty comfortable around people. Um, they're active in the early morning and early evening, especially when they have young in their nest. And uh, March is the month that they pair off and they start nesting. Um, they're probably sitting on eggs now, and by May, they'll probably start having young. And that's when they'll start uh, becoming more and more possibility for somebody to see who's either um, out early in the morning or out um, late in the afternoon. Um, and they're just fascinating to listen to. Two males in a neighborhood um, will make their who cooks for you call back and forth declaring habitat. If a male and a female are together, the female doesn't have as deep a uh, call. So you can actually tell the sexes apart. They'll start singing to each other and courting. Uh, I've been lucky enough this year, my wife and I have, to have a pair that's frequently uh, calling and chattering with each other uh, close to our house. Um, and if I get up early to lead a walk, bird walk and I go out to get the paper, it won't be uncommon for me to hear two or three of these calling scattered around, uh, some very close and some far in the distance. Um, they're very common along the Potomac River. And it's uh, if you uh, live near the Potomac River or you walk in one of the parks near there uh, in early evening or very early morning, there's a good chance that you will hear these birds. Um, and their sounds are very distinctive. Um, this is another owl. This is a species of concern. It's a barn owl. This owl is actually perched in a barn. It's sleeping. Um, one of the things the Loudoun Wildlife Conservancy does every year is a birdathon in order to raise funds. And the team that I'm on, we actually found this owl in a barn uh, a few years ago. Um, people have a tendency to harass owls to see them. They'll try to get them to move. They'll wake them up. So it is good protocol to keep their locations private and then not share their locations with other people. Uh, people will actually even throw rocks at some of them sometimes, so they'll open up or turn their heads for the perfect pose. And it's um, not uncommon for a wildlife rehabber to actually get a screech owl in, uh, who is also another very common owl in our area, um, who's been blinded, partially blinded. And these birds can't hunt anymore. Uh, they need to be able to use their two eyes to hunt in that very low light that they um, hunt in. Uh, it's really kind of sad, but this is absolutely a wonderful bird. Um, it's call, by the way, is a scream, like somebody being murdered or killed. Um, terrifying sound. There's actually some theories, theory that Banshee Reeks gets its name from this bird, um, that one of the owners a long time ago was outside and heard, uh, you know, ghost reeks screaming on uh, the meadows, uh, the grasslands in that particular area, and that's how it got its name. Whether that's true or not, we're not sure, but we do think it sounds appropriate. Um, we have several birds of prey in the area. Uh, this is a Cooper's hawk. Um, this bird specializes in eating small birds. So if you put up a bird feeder, there's a good chance you'll get a few of these showing up at your feeders in order to eat the other birds at your feeder. It's just part of having um, feeders in your yard. Uh, this is a juvenile. Uh, I can't tell if it's a male or a female, but because it's brown and not doesn't have a gray back, um, the streaking is coarser than it would also be on an adult. Uh, I can tell that it's a juvenile and it's perched somewhere close to somebody's feeder kind of just waiting for the birds to come in. It's not uncommon. Cooper's hawks are found throughout our area. They are common nester. Um, they have a route where they fly around uh, from feeder to feeder. If they stay at a feeder, the birds won't be active there. So they'll visit a feeder briefly. They'll either successfully find food and eat it there. Or if they don't, they'll just move on to another feeder and then circle back to that other feeder, you know, five, six, ten feeders later. And like I said, you can find these throughout the county, um, regardless of how built up it is, as long as there's some wooded areas in, the, in that area. Um, this is another visitor that we get in migration. It's a rose-breasted grosbeak. Um, take a look at that beak. Isn't that impressive? That's so that it can crack open very large, hard seeds. 
and it's a really pretty bird. The females again are very uh, are much duller, but this is a rose breasted grosbeak. Um, it was um, identified uh, in the county visiting a feeder um, during migration. Um, there have been a few seen recently, and there'll probably be a few more seen uh, over the next month um, coming to feeders. They come in sometimes in ones or twos, but sometimes seven, eight, a dozen of them, and uh, they're voracious eaters. So if they do show up at your weed uh, feeders, they'll eat everything in it pretty quickly. But uh, a lot of us consider it worth it because they're so pretty. Um, this is another really unusual bird. This is a painted budding. This is not a bird that commonly shows up, but it's one of the reasons why birders get out there is they like to find rarities. This was the bird that was at Great Falls um, over on the Maryland side, but this bird has shown up in Loudoun County uh, every few years. It visits feeders. It's a big seed eater. It was eating seeds um, that were left over from um, the wildflowers and the plants at Great Falls. It was found by somebody uh, a little bit before Christmas and hung out there through January. This photo was taken in January. This is a bird, the male, that commonly nests in Florida, South Carolina, South Georgia, um, but for some reason actually wandered up here this winter, and I can guarantee you a few others will in the years to come. And uh, look at those colors. I mean, that just is just really bizarre, but really beautiful. Um, now, this is a bird that doesn't have at all the coloration of what you just saw before. By the way, the painted bunning, they frequently show up at feeders. A lot of the parks in the deep south will put out feeders and have painted bunnings show up. And when they've shown up at Loudoun County, it's because they were seen at feeders for the most part. Um, Song sparrow is, I actually think the sparrows are absolutely beautiful. Uh, again, look at the brown coloration, the patterns, uh, the way it works. There's actually some theory that some designers actually take a look at bird feathers and how they are laid together and the patterns on them to actually design clothes, rugs, and a variety of different things. And you can really see that. Um, this is a common feeder. It is a nester here, uh, but I think the ones that nest here actually travel further south for the winter. And the ones that show up here in the winter have traveled from the north to this area. This is another um, a bird, a chipping sparrow. You can see the coloration on it. Again, a really pretty bird. Uh, this bird will occasionally visit a feeder, but mostly it likes edge habitat and eats a lot of wild seeds, uh, the kind of plants that you, wildflowers you find in a meadow and all. Um, this is a pine siskin. We had a very interesting phenomena this year. A lot of birds erupted from northern U.S. and Canada, much further south. These birds, which will often show up here in the winter in small numbers, showed up here in massive numbers. If you look at the edge of the wing, you'll see that yellow right there. Look at that pointed beak. That's so it can eat smaller seeds. Um, and it has a very interesting Z sound. Um, they're still here, but they're gonna be disappearing from our area soon. Um, but because they didn't have a good food source, source further north uh, last fall, they ended up coming down here probably in the tens of thousands. Uh, I've had them at my feeder all winter long and I have friends that have as well. Um, this is another bird and incidentally, this is a bird that nests here. It's generally not here in the winter, but it does show up at our feeders in the winter time. This picture was taken here in Leesburg in January a few years ago and it was visiting a feeder. It is a Baltimore Oriole. Um, they only nest here in small numbers. Uh, most of their nesting is done in states further north, uh, like um, mid-Maryland and further north. Um, but they are an absolutely beautiful bird and delight to show up at your feeders in the wintertime. Um, this is um, a northern cardinal, and I know they're incredibly common. It's a state bird for numerous states because it is so common, but also because it's so beautiful. And if this bird was rare, I can guarantee you all of us would stop whenever it showed up and go gaga over it. Uh, it also has a beautiful song. It starts singing in February and will continue to sing for some time longer. Common feeder bird. Um, 
I'm going to conclude with a few slides because about the state of birds, and I'd be remiss if I didn't tell you about what's happening with birds. Uh, an extensive study came out last year that was done by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, National Audubon, uh, American Bird Conservancy, and a number of other birding organizations. A 50 year study which showed that the number of birds had decreased in this country by 2.9 billion birds or 30% um, in 50 years, which is a strikingly sad story. Um, most of that loss is because of habitat loss. Um, birds, like all wildlife, needs its habitat to thrive, but it's also because in some cases we degraded what habitat is left and some of our practices and behaviors have caused problems. There are a lot of things we can do to keep birds and make them come back. When we put our mind to it, we frequently have successes like we have had with bald eagles, peregrine falcons, and a number of other birds. Some birds like cerulean warblers have never been put on the Endangered Species Act, but because of the threat of putting it on that act, uh, all kinds of people have spent a lot of money trying to make sure that its habitat is protected. But um, there are a lot of things that we ourselves can do for birds to keep them safe and healthy. Um, one of the things we can do is make windows safe. You heard me talking earlier about how often millions of birds die because they run into windows um, every year. Um, another thing, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about this in a minute, is keeping cats indoors. Cats literally kill millions of birds every year. And our domestic cat is not native to the United States, so our birds did not evolve with it. Um, but like I said, I'll talk more about it. Plant native plants have less lawn. Lawn is not healthy habitat. Native plants, trees, native shrubs, uh, wildflowers, all of those are beautiful and they support bird populations. And avoid pesticides and herbicides. Use them as little as possible or not at all. Uh, they get into the system and they don't just harm our wildlife. They can be harmful to us if we're not careful how we use them. Um, Drinking shade-grown coffee can actually be very valuable. A lot of us are coffee drinkers, and uh, there's a lot of documentation that there are two ways to grow coffee. One is a traditional method with trees in the plantations where birds can thrive and live and be healthy. The other is where they maximize the sun and they have intense growing of coffee, but it ruins the soil nutrients and the coffee becomes less productive over time. Uh, so if you can, find and buy shade-grown coffee. Use less plastic. I think we're all aware of how common plastics have become and how much of a problem they've become. And the last thing that the Cornell Lab of Ornithology asked, and they have a fantastic website, by the way, called All About Birds. And you can go on that website and identify birds. They have photos, they have their songs, all kinds of stuff on there. Um, but anyway, um, Go on bird walks, share what you see, uh, become a citizen scientist and keep it. Um, and then um, last, last couple slides, I'm gonna conclude. I am a cat lover. I've had cats my entire life. This is my current cat, Emma. Um, she is an indoor cat. And for, uh, like I said, I've had cats for my entire life, but for the last 30 or 40, 30 years or so, all my cats have been indoor cats. Um, I do that for a couple reasons, um, and they'll come up in a minute, but uh, when my outdoor cat started bringing full-size rabbits home, I decided enough was enough, um, and every cat after that I kept at home. The other thing I found is by keeping my cats indoor, and this has been scientifically documented, cats will live statistically significantly years longer than outdoor cats. Um, I can't begin to recommend it. Um, the next slide I'm going to show you, I'm going to warn you, it's very graphic. Um, you may not want to look at it, especially if you're an animal lover. It's the impact of outdoor cats at one animal hospital for one month. In June of 2020, the Blue Ridge Wildlife Center, which is one of the largest wildlife rehabbing centers in the area, um, it and uh, Wildlife Veterinary uh, Care are the two largest ones in the area. Most wildlife, when they're rescued, end up at one of those two centers. They take in all kinds of wildlife. 
They took in 531 patients last June. 77 of those were confirmed cat attacks. A number of others were presumed to be cat attacks. Um, and of that 77, only 17 survived their injuries. And what so many of us don't realize is that cats are incredibly efficient, effective uh, hunters. This is a slide of what was died and killed. You had to be euthanized at that animal hospital in the month of June. And if you look at that photo, you'll see it includes hummingbirds, it includes blue jays, it includes cardinals, rabbits, voles, mice, all kinds of different things. And while it's gruesome, it is incredibly sad. Um, like I said, I absolutely love cats, but I don't think they have a good place outdoors. Um, on that note, I'd like to turn to something a little bit more positive. This is the Birds of Loudoun. It's not a field guide for identifying birds, but it's a description of all the birds we found in Loudoun County during our atlas, Loudoun Wildlife Conservancy found between 2009 and 2014. For each breeding bird in the county, there's a page that talks about its status, uh, some basic information on it, and how healthy they are. It's a very, very wonderful book, and it's extensively owned in the library. Uh, I highly recommend it. Um, and uh, there's a half page on each of the birds that just migrate through here. Um, I'd like to give credit to uh, the photographers. Um, um, I'm at the bottom, though I only had a couple photos in it, and mine were the ones that weren't the high quality, but a lot of these others, like Nicole um, and Liam and Laura McGranahan and the others, Erica, who will be leading some of our walks in the near future, uh, Mike Scorotino, uh, they're all absolutely wonderful um, um, you know, photographers, and they help with that. And on that particular note, um, if you have any questions for me and I can't answer them afterwards, uh, please check out the Loudoun Wildlife website, loudonwildlife.org. A wealth of information on it. One of the things, for example, that's on it, if you drill into it at the hour um, and use the find capability is look for Loudoun's Great Places, which by the way, the Birds of Loudoun also lists many of the wonderful parks in the county uh, that can be used. Um, and it is a, a great resource. Um, but also on our website, we'll have a written up description of things like Bless Park, Banshee Reeks, Elizabeth Mills Park, the Blue Ridge Center for Environmental Stewardship. And it'll also list um, the 10 or 12 bird walks that we're going to be doing over the next couple months uh, that we welcome anybody to come on um, as long as you can get in. But anyway, um, thank you all very much for being part of the program. And if you have any questions, please do come on board. Um, I mean, do send me an email. And thank you. And uh, Lorraine, I'll turn it over to you now for any uh, questions that may come up or anything. Thanks so much, Joe. So we do have a bunch of questions, but before I start those, I just want to say quickly that the library currently has 18 copies of Birds of Loudoun, and I highly recommend the book. I've checked it out a number of times myself, and I leave it right on a desk by my back window, and if I see a bird at the feeder that I don't recognize, I quick take the book, and it's always in there. So I've learned a lot about Birds of Loudoun by using that book and highly recommend it. Um, I also want to tell you real quick about three programs we have coming up that I think you might find interesting. On April 27th, we have a renowned expert on cicadas. You may have even seen him on some of the morning television shows. He's going to be speaking about the return of the periodical cicadas. Uh, that's Michael Rupp, and um, I, it, I think it's going to be a fascinating program. On May 12th, we have a program called Bees and Honey. It's all about bees, the history of beekeeping, and the products and health benefits of uh, made from honey. And on June 23rd, we have a program, Liz Dennison of Secret Garden Birds and Bees is going to talk about hawks and owls. Uh, she rescues these, uh, these birds when they're hurt and um, she knows all about them and is gonna share her knowledge with us. So I hope you'll join us for those programs. And now let's get started on our questions, Joe. Um, hold on a second, I've gotta go all the way 
back here. Okay, I'm new to Virginia and wanted to get involved in some conservation efforts here. Are there species that are best for making birdhouses or feeders for, and what other efforts can the general public get involved in? Mountain Wildlife Conservancy actually has a lot of different things on their website uh, that I think would help you with uh, that particular thing. It is a tremendous resource for that. Um, in terms of different things you can do, we do habitat restoration projects. Uh, we put in um, wildflower meadows, we do tree plantings, but we also tell people how they can do it themselves. Uh, we work with homeowners associations uh, in order to do the right kind of plantings along uh, paths and trails for that. And um, there are a lot of different uh, feeders that you can do, there are birdhouses you can pick uh, put up, um, and, um, you know, a lot of that type of things. Uh, I shared several of them on there uh, on my slideshow. The bluebirds uh, generally won't come to our feeders unless we also put out mealworms. Um, and a lot of people don't like putting out mealworms. You can actually buy them at, um, you know, places that specialize in bird seed, and that will end up attracting things like that. Um, but it, but it is a, a tough thing uh, to to do. Um, different kinds of seeds also make a difference. Uh, I swear by black oil sunflower and Niger seed, which is actually a type of thistle. Niger attracts a lot of goldfinches, uh, pine siskins, which you saw, uh, white-throated sparrows, and black oil sunflower attracts virtually everything, um, including several woodpecker species and a lot of different birds. Um, it is important um, to have um, some shrubbery bushes that your birds can disappear into just in case a cooper's hawk or a sharp shin hawk come along and decide that they're going to pick up their meal at your feeders as well. Uh, and I hope that answered it to some degree. Uh, and by the way, that All About Birds website, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, it's also an incredible resource for that sort of thing, not just the Land and Wildlife Conservancy. And I just want to remind everyone that Joe's contact information is on the screen there if you want to get in touch with him with more specific questions. Um, Joe, given the emergence of the broad X cicada, what birds or behaviors could we expect to see? Um, it's going to be absolutely fantastic um, to watch birds during May and June. Um, all it's like a massive feast. Uh, for all kinds of birds. And as a result, a lot of birds that are going to be raising their young at that time, which is the height of uh, nesting season, uh, the young are going to have a really high survival rate this year. Uh, you're going to see mockingbirds, brown thrashers, catbirds. Any bird that occasionally eats insects is going to be going after cicadas. That's one of the reasons why there's so many of them, um, is because um, if there weren't so many of them, enough of them wouldn't survive for that next uh, bloom in population 17 years from now. Um, but it does mean that a lot of birds are going to end up surviving during that time period, and we're going to find them around. Another bird that we'll have a whole lot of this year that we usually only have in small numbers are yellow-billed cuckoos, which is uh, a bird that's about nine inches long, uh, has a very interesting call, it's very large. They absolutely love cicadas, and they're going to be coming in and eating them in extensive numbers. Um, a lot of our mammals, by the way, also will eat the insects, and so will our dogs. In fact, um, I know the last time the cicadas were here, I had some friends that had to keep their dogs inside uh, most of the time because their dogs would become gluttons on the cicadas and eat too many of them and get indigestion. Um, so uh, it's, it's going to be a phenomenon to watch. Um, it, it is disturbing to some people, but it's something absolutely fascinating. Uh, they basically do minimal harm, so I highly recommend watching it. And I think you having a program on it should be of great interest to any of your viewers. Yeah, uh, the guy who's going to be speaking is just pretty incredible, and he, he's very funny too, so it should be a really good program. Um, I do have so many birds this year in my backyard. Is it because of the cicadas or is it just because of COVID, you know, I'm noticing them more or there's less planes flying overhead? I think it's primarily because of COVID and you're at home watching them. Um, 
The cicadas have had no impact yet. They wouldn't have any impact yet. Um, our winters are milder. And as a result of our winters being milder, some of the birds that would have gone further south before are staying in our area. But this is also what's called an eruption year, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, birds that normally don't come in from the north are showing up here. Um, besides the pine siskin, which showed up at our feeders extensively, evening grosbeaks showed up at a lot of people's feeders. And evening grosbeaks had not been seen here in Virginia in any type of number since 1990. And they hadn't really been here in large numbers since the 1980s. And, um, and I think those are the less common species that show up, but what it means is that the more common species that show up here probably show up here in larger numbers because they're getting pushed out of uh, areas further north, either because of a harsher winter or more likely because their food crop just wasn't successful or healthy this particular last season. Okay. What is the difference between bird behavior in the morning and in the early evening? I have heard that the best time for birding is at dawn because birds get hungry after the night and are active and vocal. They seem to be active and vocal in the early evening as well, though. Why are they so active before dusk? Um, they, they got up early in the morning. They did a lot of singing. They were very active. Um, and you know, dawn chorus actually refers to the massive song that you'll get with birds early in the morning. And it's because when they wake up, they're hungry, just like you and I are. Um, and they go out and eat, and then they get a lot of food. And then once they are um, gotten enough food, they'll slow down, they'll be quiet, they'll sleep during the day. But then there'll be a spurt of energy, not as extensive as it is in the morning, but it'll occur again in the evening um, before uh, it becomes dark. Most birds are not active at night, so what they're doing is they're getting an evening meal uh, before dusk. And in contrast to you and I, birds can never count on a good meal two days in a row or three days in a row. If the weather is lousy the next day, they may not get anything to eat. So they make sure that they get what they can when they can. And uh, as a result, they'll do some stuffing at certain times. Um, where you know, we don't need to do that because we're pretty sure of where we're going to, most of us are pretty sure where we're going to get a meal whenever we want it. Um, another comment, I once saw what I believe to be three great egrets on a little island in the middle of the pond. I have never seen so many of them at the same time. Were they likely a family? Um, great egrets, like great blue herons, are social birds. They're comfortable together in groups. I've seen actually as many as nine in a few places in Loudoun County uh, along the Potomac at the Dulles Greenway wetlands. Um, and um, they, um, they do group together. Um, and when they disperse from their nesting rookeries, they have a tendency to group together um, because they are social and comfortable with each other. Those may have been related, but it's also likely that they, they were just comfortable being together. Okay. I see many red-shouldered hawks where I live, and they seem to be shy of people when they are sitting on branches. As soon as I am about 20 feet away, they fly away. I find it curious that birds of prey are so scared. Is there a specific reason for it? Um, a bird of prey, you're absolutely enormously as a human being intimidating to a bird of prey. Red-shouldered hawks are probably, are definitely the most common hawk in Loudoun County. Um, they live very comfortably around people. They nest near people throughout the county and every part of the county. Um, I have a nest in my yard this year. I have friends that live in the South Riding area that have them nesting and the same thing in the Cascades area. But at the same time, um, you are a threat to them. Um, a bald eagle, which is one of our largest raptor, he only weighs nine pounds. Um, that, and I don't remember exactly, but if, but I think a red-shouldered hawk only weighs two and a half or three pounds. Um, so even though they're a bird of prey, um, they aren't going to be preying on you, so they are going to be scared of you. They're going to be cautious around you. Um, and if they think that you're watching them, they'll um, 
change their behavior and be somewhat more cautious about it. Uh, most birds are scared of us, and if we get too close to them, they'll fly away. Some birds become so um, used to us that they aren't scared of us anymore, but that's actually not a good thing um, because then they could end up being inadvertently injured. Does the Loudoun Wildlife Conservancy offer birding programs for children, or do you have suggestions for getting children started in birding? Uh, the Loudoun Wildlife Conservancy does do occasional programs for birds uh, on birding for children. Um, we haven't done a whole lot lately. Uh, I'd personally like to see us do more. Uh, I'm not great with kids myself, so I don't do those. Um, and those of us that were good with it, most of them have retired, but we're hoping now that COVID is lighting up that we'll be doing more of that again in the near future. Um, and what I would do is um, we will do a special event um, for a Girl Scout troop or a Cub Scout troop, uh, a school class and that sort of thing um, for, for children. So if somebody has something they want, kids are also welcome on all of our bird walks if they're interested. Uh, their parents and the kids are welcome on them. Um, it isn't always an activity that a lot of children enjoy because it can be slow. Um, so I always recommend the parents to feel free to leave um, if their kids don't find it to be a fun event. Uh, but most of our trip leaders are very happy to have families along and to share their love of birds with families or with kids. And I think we will be doing more programs uh, for kids in the very near future. I like this question because I just had to chain, uh, add more food to my bird feeder yesterday. Can you comment on the salmonella outbreak and how much of an issue it is in Loudoun? Uh, salmonella outbreak is definitely an issue with um, feeder birds. It primarily occurs where birds mass together. Um, they claim it is because of feeders that aren't kept clean. It is most common in house finches. Um, uh, where it causes conjunctivitis, uh, eye diseases, and obviously a blind bird is not going to survive a very long time. Um, the best way to avoid it is to keep your feeders clean um, and, um, and um, make sure that you change your food very regularly um, and periodically. And um, the recommendation is if you do have an outbreak of that at your feeders, they may not be bringing it from your feeders. They may have found it somewhere else um, at feeder stations that weren't being well maintained. Uh, but it is recommended that you take your feeders down, clean them and leave them down um, for a few days so that that particular bird population can disperse. Um, it seemed to be a significant issue this year, and I think uh, it happened when the temperature started to get warm and um, you know, we had some moisture at the same time. And those end up being conditions that are pretty conducive um, to that outbreak. Can you just tell us real quick about cleaning, keeping clean, clean a bird feeder? What do you suggest? How um, often should it be cleaned? And what do you use to clean it? Um, I actually soak mine in water and scrub them with a bottle brush um, when I think they need it. Um, I don't see much signs of the disease at my feeders itself, so I probably don't do it as often as I should. Um, but I take them down and I'll actually put a little bit of peroxide in with that water. Uh, and I use a bottle brush, like I said, if it's a certain kind of feeder that I should take apart, I do. Um, then I let them air out, dry out completely before I refill them. And uh, you can just do it with hot water or just cold water and rinse them as well. Um, Another thing that is recommended is that you not leave waste seed in the bottom of the feeders uh, because it will rot and actually can be a problem. And if you have waste seed that's collecting under your feeders, um, I would avoid that as well. I'd clean it up and throw it away. Um, one of the advantages of black oil sunflower is you can buy it on hell unhulled. And while it's expensive to purchase that way, there's no waste that way, um, and it disappears incredibly quickly. 
Okay, and signs of disease would be if you see dead birds nearby or? Well, one of the things, no, no, it's, you rarely find dead birds, they're scavenged very quickly. Remember, they weigh a, a tiny amount and there's all kinds of things that will scavenge them. Squirrels will come in and take them, uh, that sort of thing. Usually you see visible signs of them. Um, the conjunctivitis is most common. The other thing we have to remember is that like us, birds age and uh, a bird that should migrate, if it's an old bird, um, if it's getting on in years, it's gonna be less prone to migrate. It's gonna stay at your feeders, it's gonna be slow. And sometimes it might be slow enough so that it actually gets picked off by that Cooper's hawk when it's flying through your neighborhood. Um, that's sad, but it is a fact of life. Um, if it's injured with a broken wing or something like that, um, then what I do recommend you do is call one of the wildlife rehab groups. And um, the Blue Ridge Wildlife Center is a tremendous resource. Uh, wildlife Veterinary Care is another resource. And uh, there's the Wildlife Rescue League as well. All of them, they'll give you advice on it, on taking care of birds. They'll tell you if there really is a problem. Not every time we think there's a problem, there is a problem. Young birds have a tendency to climb out of their nest and sit on a branch close by, sometimes fall on the ground. Um, quite frequently, the best thing to do for them if they aren't in danger is to just leave them be. Other times, it's to replace them into the nest. Okay. But it is how astounding how rarely we actually do see dead birds and how uncommon it is to see sick birds except for conjunctivitis in a lot of, in, uh, you know, house finches at our feeders. That is the most common and even that's relatively rare. How do other birds react to northern mockingbird medleys? Do they get fooled by them? What is the reason for mockingbirds to copy other birds' song? Um, I think uh, northern mockingbirds, brown thrashers, and catbirds are all pretty effective mimics. So are blue jays, um, and so are starlings, actually, by the way. And um, one of the things is that's just part of their song. It's part of their repertoire. It's part of what they're doing and other birds are not being attracted to them. I do think some blue jays, some of the sounds they imitate, like a blue jay actually does a tremendously effective uh, imitation of a cooper's hawk. Um, I think they do that in order to keep other birds away uh, that they don't want near their nest. Uh, I don't see a blue jay do that when it's visiting my feeders, but I do see it out in the woods where I think it may be nesting. Um, but um, I think there's a lot of things that we don't know about birds and a lot of things that we're learning about birds all the time. But those brown thrasher songs, those beautiful imitations, the northern mockingbirds imitations, uh, some of which are incredibly effective, are not attracting other species, but they're often fooling us into thinking that other species are there. I think it's just part of its territorial song. Uh, someone is asking, how do we keep English house sparrows away? Um, it's actually a major problem. Um, and English house, bee, house sparrows can actually be a nuisance. Um, their numbers are actually in decline for the most part in the United States. Uh, they're not nearly as populous as they once were. Um, one of the reasons is that they absolutely boom with um, horses. Um, and the extensive use of horse because they ate the seed that was in their manure. Um, and um, keeping them away is actually almost impossible. Um, they are non-native birds, so it is okay to destroy their nests. It's against the law to destroy any native North American bird's nest or harm any native North American bird um, without a license if it's a hunting species like you know one of the ducks or um but if it's not you can't do anything without without permission um from the federal government or from the state game warden um that's not true of house sparrows um english house sparrows which is actually european or eurasian house sparrow um they're common uh throughout the area even though their numbers are down they will show up at feeders um 
and uh, there is no real effective way to control them to keep them away. We have cat birds that nest in very in a very large bush next to our house. Is there a good or bad time of year to prune that bush back? Um, that cat bird will probably only be using that nest, um, you know, for a short period time period. Uh, I wouldn't prune it while it's actually sitting on eggs, uh, and I wouldn't prune it when it has yen in the nest. Uh, but as soon as those young leave that nest, uh, it would be perfectly appropriate to prune the bush. If that bush, if it's okay to prune that bush at that time of year, um, some bird, some bushes are uh, pruning is very appropriate in uh, winter and late winter, and that's an ideal time to prune some bushes. Um, other times, it's basically a, a matter of sitting back and waiting until they've successfully left the nest. I frequently had that happen to me with uh, uh, morning doves, which nest in some of the bushes I would have liked to have pruned if I'd been more on top of my gardening. Okay, uh, this attendee writes, I have had a Carolina wren around my house for months now. It even made a hole in the garage insulation this winter to sleep in, so I had to have a garage door opening routine each day. Is this bird attracted to houses and humans as it appears to be very comfortable with people and is still here? Carolina, that's a resident. He's not a migrant. He'll stay around. Carolina wrens are very common around people. Um, they frequently, they and house sparrows actually frequently um, nest in garages and uh, they'll actually nest in large office building garages where the doors come open and down. They'll watch the garage doors for when they come open and down. I, I keep my garage doors closed um, all the time so that I won't have Carolina wrens come in and uh, build a nest. Um, they'll build a nest virtually almost anywhere I've had them build them in uh, the edge of my uh, flower pots before where I had to end up being cautious on how much water I uh, watered, uh, put in the plant to keep it alive. Um, and they're wonderful singers. They're very vocal. Their behavior is a lot of fun. And when they're young uh, are born, they're just great fun to watch. Um, but they, they can be a minor nuisance uh, with where they want to nest. And they will actually nest very early in the spring, as early as February, if the conditions are fine um, and they're, if they think the conditions are okay for it. Okay, we have two more questions. What equipment would you recommend for someone who is interested in getting into bird watching? Um, the binoculars are an absolute must. Um, and there are a lot of different binoculars on the market. I would actually Google uh, binoculars and try to find one of the uh, reliable sources like National Audubon, uh, Cornell Lab of Ornithology, um, National, um, as well as Bird Watchers Digest, and take a look at the different quality of binoculars that are being recommended. They'll do different price ranges. Um, and they'll make different kinds of recommendations on them. One of the things I do recommend if you buy binoculars is it is useful to try to get ones that are close focus. People used to not care about that, but now there are a lot of people that are also using their binoculars to look at butterflies, especially during July and August when birds aren't that active um, or uh, other times of the year. So it helps to have that feature. Binoculars can vary significantly in price. So the best thing to do is to kind of get out there on a bird walk with people that have some and see um, if they'll loan you their pair to look through. I know a lot of people are very reluctant to do that now in the time of COVID, uh, but COVID will be ending at some point and people will be able to start doing that again. Um, but that's an absolute must and it is what I recommend for uh, anybody doing bird watching. Okay, last question. How can you become a citizen scientist and monitor birds? Uh, become connected um, with one of the organizations that's out there that does it. There are a number of them in our area. Loudoun Wildlife Conservancy has several citizen science programs. Um, we do, uh, we have our own Christmas bird count, the Central Loudoun Count. 
We do a couple other counts that we participate in extensively. Our Bluebird Trail program is a citizen science program. Um, we do butterfly monitoring. Uh, we do the butterfly count the 1st of August, and um, we measure and con uh, keep a lot of data that way, turn it into a lot of places uh, that, um, that document it and keep it and use it for research. Uh, the Audubon Society of Northern Virginia does the same thing. Um, they're based in Fairfax and do a lot of programs in Fairfax County, Eastern Loudoun, Prince William County. And then there are a number of other organizations out there as well. Audubon Naturalist Society in uh, Maryland. And there are several bird clubs um, in the area that also participate in these. The Northern Virginia Bird Club is a wonderful club if you're just interested in bird walks. Uh, they advertise citizen science projects extensively and right across the river in Frederick County, Washington County and Montgomery County. Uh, they're very active bird clubs that also do a lot. So I have two more questions that just kind of snuck in here and one I I know that um, the head of our collections department is listening and if she would answer this question. Um, someone is saying that at one time the Ashburn Library would lend binoculars. Leah, do we still have binoculars in our libraries? If you would let me know, I can answer this question. And then the other question, Joe, if you don't mind one more. Canadian geese are thugs. What can be done to keep them away? Um. The, actually, it's interesting. Canadian geese didn't used to be migrants. Um, male Canadian geese, uh, once they mate and they mate for life, um, they will uh, stay with the female forever until the female dies or until they die. And um, Canadian geese numbers had declined a lot. People wanted to bring them back, so they brought in non-migratory Canadian geese. And as a result, we watched their populations expand, expand uh, considerably. Um, one thing that Canada geese do not like is they do not like meadow habitat. They do not like tall grass. They do not like trees because their predators hide in it. And the most effective way to not have um, Canada geese around is to actually not have a lawn, but actually to have a meadow, to have a lot of grass. Um, but the Humane Society of the United States has um, a pamphlet that they put out on living with Canada geese, and it talks about humane ways to discourage Canada geese, um, different ways to do it. Uh, people use border collies. Uh, you have to do it at airports. You don't want a flock of Canada geese resident at Dulles Airport or National Airport. Uh, and quite frequently, some places, and I know Boston does, um, they actually use Canada geese, uh, use dogs to run the Canada geese off the runways as well as to keep the uh, snowy owls off the runways. Um, but that's the most effective thing. But I would recommend people Google uh, the Humane Society for that pamphlet and uh, or brochure that they have and to see what might work in their particular neighborhood. Okay, and I did hear from Leah. So uh, you can check out I Love Virginia State Parks backpacks from our libraries, and they include binoculars. They also include passes to Virginia State Parks. So uh, there's all kinds of neat little things in those backpacks uh, if you want to check them out. And again, they do include binoculars, so we would recommend those. And you can speak to any of your branch librarians about how to uh, get them and check them out with your card. Okay, well, that's it for the questions. Um, just, uh, yeah, that's it for the questions. Thank you so much, Joe, for sharing your knowledge with us and helping us become more acquainted with birds. We're so lucky to have so many beautiful birds in Loudoun County. Thank well, you. thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Um, Loudoun Wildlife loves to work with the Loudoun County Public Libraries. You're an absolutely wonderful resource. Uh, with a wealth of information and a wealth of bird guides, by the way, identification guides. Um, a lot of my favorite guides are in your libraries, and it's a good way for people to check out uh, what the guides are. And a lot of those same guides are actually available now as apps. 
And if you can find one that you like at the library, check it out and see if it is available as an app and put it on your phone. Um, one of the nice things about it being on your phone is they often include the songs. And that's not something that you get out of a book very easily. Um, but anyway, thank you all very much. And um, just for your information, this program has been recorded and will be on the library's YouTube station. Uh, so just Loudoun County Public Library YouTube, but probably not until early next week. Thank you all again for joining. And we hope to see you in some of those other programs in the upcoming weeks. Bye-bye.